Okay, let's get underway. I was just, uh, we got through a little bit early at 8.30. <coughs> July is a little bit harder to time. Uh, at 11 o'clock, we normally have more visitors in July than we do at 8.30, of course, and so when we go around the room and let people tell us where they're from, it takes a little bit longer at 11, so I was trying to get our timing down for television and uh, be sure that we could come in in the allotted time so uh, to to uh, leave a little bit more time for out-of-towners at 11 uh, made us get through just a couple of minutes early at 8.30. So, uh, But I didn't want to start Sunday school until we'd really given you fair time to get here. Okay, we're dealing with Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, the first letter that we have. Last week we dealt with chapter 1, the verse seven, first 17 verses, and today we're going to pick up with verse 18 of chapter 1. Let me remind you just a little bit about the setting here. Uh, I've drawn uh, a map for you. We've let the bigger ones move on to some Sunday school classes that are, that are dealing with uh, more extensive travels of Paul. But I think this will help you just review quickly uh, what we're talking about. Uh, to orient you, of course, this would be the Mediterranean Sea, Dead Sea, Sea of Galilee, the Jordan, Jerusalem, Paul's birthplace, Tarsus, the place from which we believe he was writing this letter, Ephesus, this is modern-day Turkey. When Paul had a vision to come over to Macedonia, he crossed over the Straits of Bosphorus, and went to Philippi, named for Philip of Macedon, the father of Alexander the Great, when he was uh, beaten and thrown into jail there because he was refuting the false gods and goddesses that were worshipped at Philippi. And the people who sold the little gods and goddesses were making a very good living at that. If Paul could convince the populace that these things were absolutely worthless, you can see what it would do to their business. So they trumped up charges and beat him and put him in jail. There was an earthquake. Um, he was sprung from jail, moved on down the Roman road called the Via Ignatia and uh, to Thessalonica and on down to uh, a couple of other spots. Every time the folks at Philippi who opposed him heard that he hadn't really gone away, they followed him right on down. So he fled then down to Athens. And he had a miserable experience there, I told you. He tried to debate philosophy with these folks who were steeped in the, in the uh, uh, logical reasoning of Plato, Socrates, Aristotle. And uh, he tried to reason with them from Aristotelian logic. Didn't work. Miserable experience. He crossed over then to Corinth and spent at least 18 months there, supported himself as a, as a, uh, a worker in leather, okay, uh, and a tent maker. He tells us in, in the book of Acts that he was a tent maker. And then he moved on to Ephesus. We know that he stayed in Ephesus a little more than two years. I put a little dot out in the, in the Aegean Sea there to tell you where Patmos is the little island where the Revelation was written. And scholars, uh, Protestant scholars, are not positive where John ended up and the community sprang up around John, the apostle of Jesus. But the Eastern Orthodox, who were Christianity in this part of the world uh, until the time of the Crusades, when there was a... Uh, pillaging of the famed Church of St. Sophia in Constantinople by the Western Christians and the Eastern Christians and Western Christians haven't really gotten along, Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholics, ever since that time. Uh, but Father Bill Christ and those who represent Eastern Orthodoxy in our community are convinced that John ended up here in Ephesus and uh, lived out his life there, and <clears throat> that his followers then produced the Gospel of John, the letters, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the Revelation. Now, our scholars, I mean our United Methodists, we have 13 seminaries in this country, as you know, they believe that one faith community did produce all five of those works, 
not necessarily the same person, probably not the same person, but the vocabulary is so similar, the way things are described, that, that they're convinced that, that the writers of the Gospel, the three letters, and the Revelation came out of the same faith community. So Ephesus was a very important place. A Roman city, of course, at this time, the Romans controlled the Mediterranean world um, in, in our New Testament times. Uh, so Paul is writing, we think, from Ephesus back to Corinth. And word is, has come to him, he tells us in the first chapter, from Chloe's people. That's all we know about them. Chloe's people have come and said they're having problems and they're arguing among themselves. But today we're going to get into his defense, if you would, of why things didn't go well for him in Athens and how he changed his approach when he went to Corinth. So rather than arguing with them from Aristotelian logic that there is a God and so on, uh, he became more the Jew that he was, who now believed that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah of the Jewish people. Now, of course, made uh, available to Gentiles as well, non-Jews. So that's what he's dealing with here in uh, the 18th verse and what follows. And, and I'll be able to show you this, I think, very clearly as we move along. Let's pray. God, we so quickly take this book for granted. Someone gave us a Bible when we were young. And we've had opportunity to buy others for ourselves we take it for granted that these 66 books just happened. But we know when we think seriously they didn't just happen. Real people wrote every word that you found those real people and helped them uh, through the inspiration of their hearts and their minds to write great words. Even if they didn't know they were writing Holy Writ, the fact that they were pouring out their heart and their faith to others caused our mothers and fathers of the faith to decide this is holy writ and ought to be forever considered holy writing. So help us understand what Paul was writing to the church at Corinth to determine what it has to do with us uh, in the living of our lives in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 2012. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now stop for a moment and think about what he means when he talks about the foolishness of the cross. And the foolishness of the cross is that we hold that the one true God who created the heavens and the earth put a part of himself in Mary's child Jesus and allowed that to be crucified. That's what the world saw as foolishness. Foolishness that the one true God would let this happen to the clearest revealer of him ever in history? Come on, you've got to be kidding, they would say. And that is what all four of the gospel writers were struggling with, and that's what Luke was struggling with in his book of Acts, and it's what Paul is going to struggle with in letter after letter that he writes to different faith communities. Could one who was crucified really be seen as the Son of the Almighty, the one in whom God was truly present? That's what he's talking about here. Uh, so when he talks about the foolishness of the cross, he means that most people saw it as that. That this most horrible way of putting people to death that the Romans knew, who used this as their act of terrorism. Theologians have written that as horrible as, as we know suicide bombers to be today, that suicide bombers are trying to accomplish what the Romans did when they crucified people. You scare people into doing what you want them to do. That's the whole purpose of suicide bombings. Uh, we will send a woman or a man with explosives strapped to them into your buses where your kids go to school or whatever. We know where your kids live. It's to try to change your behavior. It's a horrible way to do it. But that's what terrorists do. 
and the Romans were terrorizing the population with crucifixion. And if people got sufficiently frightened of the Romans, then the Romans could bring the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. I mean, look at what happened when the Soviet Union fell apart. People who had been made to live side by side in Bosnia, Herzegovina, and other places, when Muslims and Christians had been made to live together peacefully for all those years that the Soviet Union had them under the thumb when they became free, they started killing each other again. I mean, terrorism can work. It's not, not the way to have peace that you and I would prefer. I mean, we're for democracy. We're for people voting. Dr. Marlon Levenhar is the pastor of the All Souls Unitarian Church. Uh, a, a very interesting fellow, when he was graduated from Harvard Divinity School, he decided that before he would start pastoring a church, he wanted to, to see how as many people of the world lived as he could on a bicycle tour around the world. Start riding a bicycle around the world. I, uh, he's a part of our downtown clergy lunch group, and so shortly after he came to Tulsa, I was sitting next to him one day and asking him about this, and I said, gee, you rode a bicycle through Syria? Yep. You rode a bicycle through communist China? Yep. And I said, and nobody ever hurt you? And he said, no, you're very safe in those countries. They maintain peace with the iron hand. The iron hand. They are the law. If you steal something, they cut your hand off. You know I'm not advocating that. I'm simply telling you that it is a way to maintain peace. People steal something, cut their hand off. If they rape and plunder, you kill them. You don't lock them up in prison for the next 50 years. And feed them, you, you kill them right away. It's, it's a way to maintain law and order. It's not the way you and I prefer or what we think God prefers, but it works. And uh, so he said in these, uh, you know, dictator-dominated countries, he could ride a bicycle and nobody bothered him because they were afraid to steal his backpack or his bicycle because somebody cut their hands off. Uh, so he was safe. Now... In a country dominated by terrorism and conformity to that fist that's on them, the Roman fist, to try to sell them that the Savior of the world was a victim of a Roman crucifixion was a tough sell. That's all I'm trying to say. It was a tough sell. And so Paul sees two groups of people in the world, but not Jews and Gentiles any longer, not Greeks and barbarians any longer, but those who are still perishing, doing all the things that lead to death, and those who are being saved. Notice how it's a present tense verb, still being saved. Paul believed that he had made a right turn, a proper turn, after that experience on the road to Damascus, but in any number of his writings, he talks about the things I want to do. I don't end up doing all the time. I revert to my old ways. So he's still using this expression, I'm, we're being saved or we're moving on to all these ways that perish. And to those who are still perishing, doing it that way, the cross was foolishness foolishness that God would let his son be crucified. But to us who are being saved, we see in that cross the power of God. See the argument he's trying to make? Okay, let's go on. So, verse 19 says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. Those are the kind of folks he met in Athens. And the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, that is, all this Aristotelian logic did not bring them to a knowledge of the one true God. I mean, look at the golden age of Greece. It's already been more than 300 years since Plato, well, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. More than 300 years. Has it saved the Greeks, Paul's asking? No. Has it saved the Romans? No. They're still heathen. They're still pagan. 
So God tried a different way. The foolishness of the cross. Okay. I mean, as the world sees it, foolish. Okay. Since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation. I mean, he's saying, I know that what we're saying when we tell God's story, the story of Jesus of Nazareth, which later, of course, was made into a book and a movie, the greatest story ever told. Okay, but some see this as foolishness, what we're proclaiming. To Through this foolishness of our preaching, God has chosen to save those who believe that the Almighty was in fact present in Jesus of Nazareth. For Jews demand signs, Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are the called those who get it, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. You get that? Okay. I think that's, I think that's clear from what we've been saying. Uh, again, we... Christians need, I think, philosophy. When I was in undergraduate school, you couldn't, you couldn't get in seminary when I was coming along. They lowered the standards a few years ago. They're having trouble uh, getting enough preachers. They started lowering the standards. But, but when I was admitted to the seminary, you had to have a lot of prerequisites in psychology and uh, philosophy. You had to have taken uh, eight hours of philosophy and so on before you could even get in. You had to have three years of foreign language when, when I went there. It's not true anymore. You don't have to do that. So I was taking German and Latin at the same time in college because in my high school I didn't have, didn't have those opportunities. <clears throat> and I was finishing my undergraduate degree in three years. So I was taking uh, Latin and German at the same time. Uh, to be sure I met the prerequisites. What I'm saying is, I believe philosophy is important. But Paul is saying it's not all important. And let me help you here. After the Roman Empire fell, the Roman Empire fell, they had made possible all the trade that went on between cities. And when that central government collapsed, you know that Europe went into the ages called the Dark Ages. And it wasn't a decade or two. It was several hundred years, the Dark Ages. People had to move back out onto the land. When commerce stops, cities cannot function. If food is not being brought in, you know, they can't function. If the coinage really doesn't mean anything. You say, our coinage, our, our paper money means something because our government says it means something. If our government were to fail completely, then our paper would be worthless. You see, when the Roman Empire fell, Europe went into the Dark Ages. Uh, so what happened was that religions became more ignorant and superstitious. It is said of small children, they are very astute observers. They are very poor interpreters. They see everything. They understand very little. And that's the reason when there's a divorce, little children tend to blame themselves. Even sometimes when there's a death of a parent, little children get the idea that maybe they did something wrong. And so ignorance and superstition crept back into the faith. And the Roman Catholic who rediscovered Aristotelian logic and brought logical thinking back into faith was St. Thomas Aquinas. And at almost the same time, God raised up a great Jewish thinker to do the same for them, and his name was Moses Maimonides. Moses Maimonides was born in Spain. Today, when you go to Spain... They love to show you a beautiful statue signifying the birthplace of Maimonides. What they don't want to tell you is they threw him out of Spain because he was a Jew. 
He lived most of his life in northern Africa. And so Moses Maimonides knew a lot about Islam, but he also rediscovered Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle. And what Thomas Aquinas did for the Roman Catholics and therefore the Western Church, Moses Maimonides did for Judaism. And John Wesley, in the four things called the Wesleyan Quadrilateral, number one in importance for us in theological truth is Scripture. Second is tradition, and the Wesleys meant by that other writings that didn't get into the book but are as close to the historical Jesus as possible. And number three is logic. Faith should not be unreasonable. And in college, I had to take logic. The only problem about taking logic is it will drive you nuts because most things you hear are not logical. Most of the arguments you hear on television, whether it's politics or whatever, are not logical. When you learn that only if this and this be true, then this be true. Our, our uh, professor, Dr. Webb Pomeroy, used to use for examples. He was trying to teach his children how to think. And so he would say, you know, when, when they, his wife had baked a pie, he would sometimes say to the kids, there will be no pie before beans. And the kids would eat their beans and then say, now pie. And he said, I didn't say there would be pie after beans. I said there would be no pie before beans. <laughs> and he let them think about it a while. Listen carefully to what's being said, you know. So if you read lots of ads and you listen to lots of politicians, you'll discover that much of what they say is not logical. And it's the same thing that happens to English teachers. It drives them up the wall when people, you know, cannot do the objective case of pronouns because they know what it's supposed to sound like. It's why it drives Gail and me nuts when you see people using the word few and less as being different. Uh, Less is a quantity that's not easily measured, like flour. You have less flour, more flour. But if you can count something, it's fewer. You go to the grocery store and it says, you know, here's a checkout line. If you have less than 12 items. No, it's fewer than 12. Anyway, if you, if you don't know these things, it doesn't bother you. If you know them, it bothers you, you know. It's not less items, it's fewer, fewer, because you can count them. And they're even asking you to count them, so it's fewer. Anyway, same thing with putting apostrophes in the wrong place, right, Virginia? When you put apostrophes in the wrong place, uh, you know, I, in rural areas, I used to see people, you know, their kids would go to shop in high school and they'd make a wooden sign to put out by their mailbox and they would often uh, you know not get the plural correct um, some one of the grandkids made my mom and dad one and uh, so it, it, it had on there the bigses now do they mean plural or do they mean you know possessive this is the bigses farm or this is where the bigses live and those are not written the same. They're, they're very different. Well, anyway, logic, the Wesley said, is supposed to be a very important part of your faith. Faith is not supposed to be unreasonable or illogical. I remember years ago, we had a new preacher of another denomination come into downtown Houston. And uh, he started drawing big crowds, church just about three blocks from First Methodist. And Dr. Charles Allen asked me one Sunday, he said, would you be willing to give up your spot in the morning service? I preached every Sunday night and go down to that church and see what's going on down there. Tell me what's really going on down there. I said, sure. So that Sunday, I, I walked down the street to that other church and, and I watched from start to finish. And uh, when I got back, I, I said to Dr. Allen, you know, I saw this person that I'd seen on television, a big lawyer, big doctor, big this, you know, educator. And this preacher, everything he was saying was so illogical. In many cases, I'm convinced, not true. He was saying, for example, he and his wife went to Israel, and there in the lobby of the Jerusalem Hilton, they converted a Jewess to Christianity. <laughs> 
It didn't happen, folks. It doesn't happen when you go to Israel. You don't convert Jews in Israel to Christianity with a conversation in the lobby of the Jerusalem Hilton. It doesn't happen. So, anyway, I came back to Dr. Allen and I told him what the sermon was. Boom, boom, boom. And I said, who could believe that garbage? And he said, when they pull up into the parking lot, they turn off their brains. They turn off their brains. Last Monday morning, I got to my office and uh, had a voicemail that come in shortly after church last Sunday. It was from Fayetteville, Arkansas, and the name, not anyone I knew. Uh, the voice message said, I'm getting along in years, it was a woman, I'm getting along in years, uh, I've been a member of Central United Methodist Church in Fayetteville for 50 years. I love my church, but I'm physically not able to go every Sunday now, and you are my preacher. I watch you every Sunday on, on Channel 8. She said, I've noticed several times the last couple of months that you have described or used a word for us as homo sapien. And I wondered if that means you're telling us it's okay to believe in evolution. So I, I called her. I called her and told her who I was. And she said, I'm so glad you called. And I said to her, you are very perceptive. You are very perceptive. You got exactly what I was trying to say. Every time I meet with our middle schoolers and I meet with our senior highs, one of the questions they ask me every time is, how do I feel about evolution? And I tell them that we have at all of our great Methodist universities a department of anthropology. And we tell our anthropologists, keep digging, keep looking. I said, Gail and I went to New York City and we spent eight hours in the Museum of Natural History. One of our best days. We loved it. And here were all these little children from the public schools and so on being trekked through this museum where it was showing them that if you dig down to a certain depth, you find no sign of life in this rock bed. But if you come near the surface, you find a one-cell life form and you come a little near the surface and there are two cells and you come a little closer and there are four cells and you come a little closer and there are 16. And so all these little children are seeing this, but according to a recent poll, if they go to 50% of the Protestant churches in America, the preacher gets up on Sunday morning and tells them it's all a lie. It's an absolute lie being told to them by scientists. And I tell our kids here, let our anthropologists tell us what they've found. Don't be afraid to let these anthropologists tell you what they have found. And at the end of the day, down in the theology school, we're going to say, so that's how God did this. I don't know if you've seen any of these programs or read any of these books, but not only are they able now to follow the the skeletal evidence, but now they can follow the DNA evidence. And they can show with DNA studies uh, when the chromosomes change, and they can show that looks like beyond a shadow of a doubt, humans, Homo sapiens, came out of Africa. And where the track went off toward Europe, and where the track went off toward Asia, and now we know that even in Australia that they thought humans came to fairly late. Did you hear this? Just the other day they have found cave paintings now in Australia almost as old as those in France. Not quite. Uh, the ones that Gail and some other, and I and some of you have seen down at Lesco and other places in France. These cave drawings down there that are more than 30,000 years old. Well, they found some that they've carbon dated in Australia now that are about 25,000 years old from the ones that are, that are called Aborigines uh, in Australia. They can show you the DNA evidence, you know, where these people went over the ice bridge into North America and South Missouri. It's interesting, fascinating. And half the Protestant preachers in America are telling kids not to believe. This recent poll said that half the Protestant preachers in America are still telling their congregations the earth is only 6,000 years old. Do you believe that? Gee. 
When I was a kid growing up, my father didn't finish high school. He had five sisters. He was the only son. And his father was older than his mother by a good many years and, and was not in good health uh, when my dad was a teenager. And he died when my dad was only 23. So dad dropped out just before his last year in high school. High school diplomas weren't considered quite so important if you were farmers back in those days. Didn't have to do all the things farmers do now. But nonetheless, he dropped out. So he didn't have a formal education, you know, beyond that, that high school that he had. But he would sit at the dinner table and tell my mother, you know, and of course we were hearing him say, today we were drilling out oyster shell down 3,000 feet. The earth's been around a long time. 3,000 feet down in East Texas, oyster shell. The earth's been around a long time, a lot longer than 6,000 years. See, they're still trying to add up all the stories in the Bible and still looking for one skeleton, Adam, one skeleton, Eve, 6,000 years old. So I said to this 85-year-old, you caught me. That's what I was trying to do. And she said, oh, good. That's what she said. Oh, good. I was hoping that's what you meant. I was hoping. And I said, well... To people who are sensitive to these things, you just say a few words and they get it. The Jewish community gets it when they tune in on Sunday morning and I mention the Hebrew Scriptures and the Christian Scriptures instead of Old and New Testaments. They get it when I mention a date like the destruction of Jerusalem in 587 before the Common Era or when I mention the first century of the common era, instead of saying Anno Domini, they get it. The Jews get it. And so when I'm in gatherings of Jewish people, there are a number of people of them that you'd be surprised. Gail can tell you how many come up to me and say, you're my Sunday morning rabbi, or I watch you every Sunday morning, because they get it. There are a few key words that they get. This is our friend. This is our friend. He's not saying his scriptures are more important than our scriptures. He's not saying that time before the coming of Jesus of Nazareth is not important, only time after Jesus of Nazareth came and so on. Okay? So to our kids, your kids, your grandkids, yeah, I'm trying to say to them, we are one primate among hundreds and hundreds of primates. But that roughly 2% of the DNA that is different from chimpanzees and great upland gorillas is a very important 2%. It's a very important 2%. And we're, you know, a monkey was not your uncle nor your grandparents, but we primates all came from a common source. And uh, gradually God infused somehow in this evolutionary process, Homo sapien, with a frontal lobe of the brain that enables us to project ourselves into the future, to be anxious about it, to be self-critical, that is, to go outside ourselves and look back at ourselves and ask questions. Not just, I like bananas, but why do I like bananas? Why am I willing to go to all this trouble to get a banana down out of that tree? Okay. So, all of that was to say, folks, we're supposed to be logical. We're supposed to be reasonable. We're supposed to believe as United Methodists in academic freedom. That is, let our great professors in different specialties go where the evidence takes them. And at the end of the day, we can say with all good faith in God, so that's how God did it. Okay. Paul didn't know that the earth was round. He didn't know that the sun was not going around the earth every 24 hours. He understood that there was something that had been added by these great philosophers, but that God was working in a different realm. Now, we would look back and say that I would at least say, I think God was helping Socrates 
I think God was helping Plato. I think God was helping Aristotle make meaningful contribution to the world's advancement. And then he decided, but, but folks weren't getting it. They were still heathen and pagan in the spiritual realm of their lives. And he tried something else. And that was appearing in a flesh and blood person. One whom he allowed to be crucified. He offered up, the gospel writers say, he offered him up. And we humans killed him. Okay, let's go on. Verse 26. He's just told them, you know, I decided I wasn't going to do in Corinth what I did in Athens. I wasn't going to climb up on that little marble mound and debate from Aristotelian logic. I was going to tell God's story. And that's what it comes down to. This proclamation is telling God's story. And the story that Paul had come to believe with all his heart and life was true. God was in Jesus doing something he had never done before. And where others might see foolishness and weakness, he saw power. And others who got it were also experiencing the power of God. So, now he brings it really close to home. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. Did you pay close attention this week? to the handshake that moved the world. Did you see that this week? What Queen Elizabeth did in North Ireland? That was tremendous, I think. She extended the hand to a man, now getting along in years, who as a young man plotted the murder of her favorite cousin, Lord Mountbatten. Lord Mountbatten introduced her and Prince Philip He's the one that said, this is the right guy for you, Elizabeth, before she ever knew, you know, she would be queen. This is the right guy for you. She loved Lord Mountbatten. And this guy in North Ireland had led the team that assassinated him, basically, on one of the royal yachts. 1977. But there's a new day in North Ireland. The real conflict in North Ireland was not just British against Irish. It was really Catholic and Protestants fighting each other. Two parts of the body of Christ killing each other decade after decade after decade. And this week, the Queen went to North Ireland and extended her hand to this man. And he shook it. I think it was it was amazing that she did that. I think it was wonderful that she did that to say, you know, somebody has to put an end to violence and bloodshed. How long can we go on killing each other's kids uh, and teaching the next generation to hate and hate and hate? I think she was wonderful. She's done a lot of good things, it seems to me, as... as, as as a presence in England, uh, she's, a, she's a wise and kind person, it seems to me. I liked what the Queen did. I thought she was terrific. Okay, let's go on. So that no one might boast in the presence of God is where we left off. And then the pronoun that follows is a clear, has as its antecedent, God. Do you see that? This is very important. In the presence of God, he, meaning God, is the source of your life in Christ Jesus. Remember what Jesus did. He pointed the way to God. And why is that important? Because you've got neighbors who just talk Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. They don't ever quite get it that God is the one who sent Jesus 
God is the one who raised the dead Jesus. And that it's ultimately about, because see, if it's just Jesus, it can be very folksy. Now, we just want to visit with you a minute, you know, sort of thing. And to see in Jesus the Almighty, the one who should cause people to quake in his presence, is to miss an important part. God is the source of your life in Messiah, Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God. Not for the world. They see foolishness. You and I see how wise God was. And then he uses three really terrific words here. Just strings them together, but they are so important. It came, became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, <coughs> boast in the Lord. Okay, let's look at those three, word, word, three words just a moment. Righteousness, I've told you over and over, be easier for you to handle if you remember it means right standing. He became for us right standing. What have I told you? The simplest statements we can make about that, we stand right with God when we trust the goodness of God, when we receive his gift. He stands at the door and knocks. If you'll open the door... He stands with grace. Will you receive it with faith? Will you trust that he does in fact love you? No, he knows your name. Knows where you live. Cares where you live. Really wants you to have an air conditioner in this hot weather. Really wants you to have something to eat every day of your life. If you trust that so, you stand right with God. You stand right with others when you do agape. The Bible says, it's what Jesus said, you do to them the way you'd like them to do to you. You see in every other human, your brother, your sister, you treat them the way you'd want them to treat. I tell you, when I started dating, what my mother did to me, it was mean and cruel to say, always treat the, any girl you date the way you want somebody to treat your sister. I loved my sister. I've loved her all her life. I couldn't get it out of my mind. Always treat the girl you date the way you want some guy to treat your sister. It's the golden rule, right? Yeah, you do to others the way you want them to do to you or to yours. If you do that, you stand right. But again, that doesn't mean always saying yes. No, it doesn't. When we were trying to raise our kids the best we knew how. We knew sometimes no was the right word. Wait was sometimes the right word. Well, you know what that means. Okay, so righteousness, right standing, it comes with God when we trust that God does love us and we receive the gift. We stand right with others. If we're doing agape, even if they say, no, no, you're not. Oh, yes, I am. Oh, yes, I am. Okay, the next big word he used was sanctification. You know this word, of course. It comes from Latin. In English it does. It comes from the Latin sanctus. It is usually translated in English as holy. And in Latin, sanctus, in English, holy means set apart. You can remember that, set apart. So holiness is mentioned way back there in the Torah. In Leviticus, things priestly. Be a set-apart people the way your God is a set-apart God. God is not like anything else. Other things may be sort of God-like, but God is God. God is always chesed, the Jew said, always steadfast, never failing love, wanting good to come to you, grieving when things not good are coming to you. So you're supposed to become more and more like him, not like them. So sanctification means set apart. When we have communion, right after the minister does the prefaces, they're called, that which comes just before, it is very meet, right, and our bounden duty. They sh we should at all times, in all places, give thanks unto thee, Holy Father, Almighty, Everlasting God, 
Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, what do we say? Holy, holy. We move to the set-apart table, to the set-apart bread, to the set-apart wine or grape juice. Set apart, and the one who was sent by the set apart one comes, comes to the table. I told you I loved the way the Catholic priest did this in Turin, in Torino. At the cathedral church that Sunday morning when he lifted the host, it sounded like our little Zimbelstern to me. We have a little part right there in the center. The centermost part of the pipes, you see that little thing right there behind the, the bottom, very bottom of the pipes? It's a little thing that Susan can make turn, and it has little chime-like things around it. As it goes around. You listen the next time you hear those, it sounds like you look and it'll be turning. Okay, That's what it sounded like when the priest lifted the host. And when he lifted the cup... Set apart, set apart. The one crucified and raised has come. He wants you to be different. Then want you to act like all of them. I want you to act differently. Okay. Next word is redemption. He is our redemption. And I've told you this word comes from the slave market. Slave market. When a person's on the block, people are bidding. Highest bidder, sold, comes up, tells them, Unlock the chains. You're free. Can you possibly imagine what that would have been like to be a slave? And there were thousands upon thousands in the Roman Empire. But not only had they had slaves, the Greeks did before them, and the Babylonians and the Assyrians, and everybody in the world enslaved people who were weaker. Never made it right. It was always wrong, always terrible. But in whatever slave market you found yourself, to have someone say, Unlock. I paid for you. I set you free. Paul believed Jesus. God in Jesus. Remember, he's just used the pronoun he, talking about God. God, what God was doing in Jesus, was saying, You don't have to keep on acting like all of them. I set you free to do it differently. And the last great enemy... Death itself. I set you free from death. I tell you, when you die, you go forth ready to live. Yeah. Redemption. Isn't it a great word? All oh, those are great words. And Paul just strings them together here. This is what God was doing. He's the source of your life in Christ Jesus. He's the one who was making righteousness possible, sanctification possible, redemption possible. And if he has done all of that, how can anyone boast except in the Lord, the goodness of the Lord? That's the only boast. Okay, is that clear? Isn't he writing, writing great stuff here? Absolutely. Okay, chapter 2. Let's get started here. Now he does a little confessing that he came to them straight from Athens where he's had this miserable experience trying to live only in their world, only in this Aristotelian logical world of theirs, and even failed miserably. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or phrases. By the way, in one of my classes, a professor assigned me a term paper on, tell me what the mystery of God was. I've never forgotten it. All those years ago. Write me 30, 40 pages on the mystery of God. You know what the mystery is? He loves Gentiles too. It was no longer debatable as far as Paul was concerned whether he loved Jews. The great mystery was he loved everybody. Non-Jews also. The great mystery. He loved them all. No homo sapien ever infused with the breath of life was not loved by the Almighty. Okay. I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom. 
Tried that in Athens, didn't work. I decided to know nothing among you except God's story. That's now Jesus, Messiah. And to put it out there, yep, he was crucified. I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Gail saw how I was agonizing before I preached at annual conference. I was sitting in, you know, she doesn't come in the sacristy on Sundays before I preach. And she doesn't know that I'm sitting there, you know, just so near throwing up. And it's unbelievable every Sunday. But she saw, you know, how, how I was agonizing before I was going to come in and preach to this church filled with Methodist preachers and lay people from across the state. Um, to try to stand up and speak for God is scary. But Dr. Bishop Williman has just uh, given his closing sermon to the Alabama Conference. I told you he's retiring from being a bishop. Eight years in Alabama, he's ready to go back to Duke. Uh, he's going back to Duke and, and teach uh, as a bishop in residence there. But in his last sermon... Uh, to all the preachers and laity of the annual conference in Alabama, he said the other day, this was written, he said, some preachers say that the great joy of their ministry is the camaraderie and so on with the people. He said, that hasn't been my experience. My greatest fear is also my greatest love, and that is to stand again and again believing that God sent me to do this that God sent me to do this. There's nothing he said that I've loved more than trying to be faithful in telling God's story. As clearly as I know how. As clearly as I know how. Paul says, My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom like I tried in Athens, but with a demonstration of the Spirit, the Ruach of God, and of dunamis power, so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, Aristotelian logic, but on the power of God. And what does he mean by that? He means, I came to tell you God's story. And God's story now must include the ethnics. The great mystery is, God's story now must include everybody. But I'm counting on the Spirit, the Ruach, to convince people that it's true. That's all a preacher can do. Be as faithful to the book. The Wesley said, that's where we start. We start with the book. I was amazed with all the seminary students that I mentored. You know, 20 of them spent a whole year with us, one after the other after the other. Now we have one who's here just three months, Ben Pasco from our own churches. We're letting him uh, work with us this summer. And I said to Ben, Ben, I don't want to hear from you 10 years from now. Well, that semester I took preaching. Not a semester. Take every preaching course they're offering. When I took Old Testament... No, you take as much of it as you can get. You take as much of the Christian scriptures as you can get. I mean every semester. You take preaching and Bible and Bible and preaching and preaching and Bible. All you can get. Well, I made Ben my speech. We'll see how he does. I'll see how you do too. Get ready to sing with me. It's July Revival. I'll be back in just a minute here. <laughs>